are witnessing a secret meeting of the most secret organization in the world. The Assassination Bureau. is the Assassination Bureau. Limited. You admit you take human life for money. Money is life. Don't you agree? You're a monster. Oliver Reed, a monster? Impossible. Impetuous, perhaps. It means, my friends, that you must kill me, or I will kill you. Careless, possibly. Considerate, certainly. A tender lover, of course. Miss Winter, surrender. Why not? A master of diplomacy. Since our relationship became less formal, I observe a tendency on your part to nag. A nag? Diana Rigg? That Avengers adventurous? Surely there's never been a more delightfully unpredictable bundle of femininity. One moment the wide-eyed innocent. Surely this is a place of assignation. And the next? I want someone assassinated. Replace the lid. Resourceful. Well done, Miss Winter. On the spot as usual. Demure. I am a British citizen! Calm in the face of danger. A deliciously diverting, delightfully irreverent chronicle of crime, wickedness, and virtue triumphant. Get your clothes off! The following is a paid advertisement. Really? A paid advertisement? Wait, the B-movie cast got paid? Yes, the following is a paid advertisement. This episode of the B-Movie Cast is brought to you by the Estate Planning Services of Twyla Minear Brooks, Attorney at Law. Remember, when the zombie apocalypse comes, things will move pretty fast. The body should be disposed of at once, preferably by cremation. Well, how long after death, then, does the body become reactivated? It's only a matter of minutes. Minutes? Well, that doesn't give people time to make any arrangements. Oh, you're right. It doesn't give them time to make funeral arrangements. The bodies must be carried to the street and, and, and burned. Uh, they must be burned immediately. Soak them with gasoline and burn them. The bereaved will have to forego the dubious comforts that a funeral service will give. Uh, they're just dead flesh and dangerous. So don't leave your estate planning needs until the last minute, because you don't know when that last minute could come. Call Twyla Minear Brooks, attorney at law, at 859-351-2294. That's 859-351-2294. Remember... When you go, you don't want people saying, Yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. Twyla Minear Brooks, attorney at law, is licensed for practice in the state of Kentucky. Consult your local attorney for matters outside of the state of Kentucky. Command Mark, the time will be running at X minus two zero seconds. Mark, five, four, three, two, one, fire. Spawned by the continuing decline and fall of society as we know it, and created on the second floor spare bedroom studio in the Piedmont of South Carolina, podcasting on a shoestring budget and changing the world one freak at a time. It's the B-Movie Cast with your host, Vince Rotolo. From coast to coast and worldwide via the internet, this is the B-Movie Cast, the podcast of unusual film and television. Hi guys, and welcome back once again to the B-Movie Clubhouse for episode 513 of the B-Movie Cast and today's film, which is a Nick pick. Before I go any farther, I want to get our contact information out of the way. We love hearing from all of you, 
So we have a feedback segment devoted to your comments and suggestions, and this is how you can contact us. Option one, pick up your phone and dial 888-936-0808. This is a toll-free number and a very easy way to leave a voice message. Option two, you can make your own MP3 file and send it into bmoviecast at gmail.com. Or use your smartphone voice software and record a call, then just send that in as an attachment instead. Or option three, if you're not into talking, you can just shoot us an email to bmoviecast at gmail.com. Our website is bmoviecast.com where you can subscribe to the podcast. It's free. And there you can join us on the Facebook bmoviecast fan page and letterbox. Also, you can play the contest by sending in your answer by email to bmoviecast at gmail.com with contest in the subject line. And check out the links while you're there or buy a t-shirt. I currently have smalls two four X's. If you want to help us financially, there's a donation box you can click on as a supporter on the Lugosi, Karloff, Agar, and the infamous Xanadu level through PayPal. Also, the easiest way to donate is to click on the Amazon bar on the right side of our homepage. This Amazon link will take you to Amazon.com to make your purchase. It doesn't cost you anything, and you can still log into your personal accounts when you get there. It's completely private, so think about us before you buy online. We have our co-host from Lexington, Kentucky, author, editor, screenwriter, film producer, Nick Brown. He has a new website, and it is authornickbrown.com. That's A-U-T-H-O-R-N-I-C-B-R-O-W-N.com. He's the author of the Werewolf for Hire series, series starting with Blood Curse. He's also selling a series of books in collaboration with his wife, Fiona Young Brown, called the B-Movie Cookbooks. All of these are available on Amazon. He has produced three movies. The first two are Rich and Loss Prevention, both of which could be ordered on Blu-ray or DVD through Amazon. And he is also the producer of the award-winning film Fall of Usher which is now available for purchase or rental on iTunes and Amazon streaming. As Walt Whitman once said, I contain multitudes, and so does our guest Bill Mize. He attended his first Star Trek convention in 1976 and met James Doohan, and a few months later got to see Gene Roddenberry speak, igniting a passion for conventions that's lasted decades, attending at least one a year if possible since then. He's an Air Force veteran, a former Walden Books manager, an award-winning mystery writer for the best first novel of the year by the Private Eye Writers of America, a certified life coach for men specializing in relationships and dating, an award-winning podcaster for his show, Bill Watches Movies, which has also been nominated three times for the Rondo Hatton Classic Horror Award for the Best Podcast of the Year and is also a very good keeper of arcane lore for the Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game, a hobby he's been enjoying since 1982. He's appeared at conventions all over the U.S. as a featured speaker, a teacher, a panel member, an MC, or just some guy drinking bourbon and eating a steak at the hotel bar. Bill recently retired and moved away from his longtime home in St. Petersburg, Florida. He now lives with his wife and kids in Winchester, Kentucky, where he's always at work on something creative or hanging out with Nick and Fiona and planning his next steps towards world domination. He can be reached via his website, BillMakesPodcasts.com, and his show can be found on all the major podcasting machines along with YouTube. The B-Movie cast is pleased to welcome Bill Mize. Today's movie is the 1969 British black comedy adventure film, or is it a campy spy killer be killed romp? You guys can decide. It's called The Assassination Bureau. It was based on The Assassination Bureau LTD, a thriller novel begun by Jack London, who had purchased the storyline from Sinclair Lewis back in 1910. He was two thirds of the way through finishing the novel. Uh, he couldn't come up with an ending, and then he died in 1916. So, 50 years later, Robert Fish finished it, and it was published in 1963. Six years later, it was made into this film. 
Uh, it's tongue in cheek, so don't take it too seriously because it doesn't take itself seriously. It kind of reminded me of Mad, 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 Mad World, only set in 1908 Europe with assassins and a different kind of inheritance. <laughs> it's a classic 60s period piece. The film's packed full of stars and character actors, so if you're a fan of Diana Rigg or Tavelli Salt, Telly Savalas. No, this isn't a replay of On Her Majesty's Secret Service, also from 69. You should enjoy this one. Keep in mind, this is a farce, not a James Bond ripoff. Uh, if you like lavish sets, dazzling costumes, great locations, you'll enjoy this. The dry humor is very British, which makes sense since it was a British production. And I thoroughly loved it. Um, by the way, I watched it on streaming, but some of the DVDs have some good extras from what I've read. Did anybody see any of the extras? I did not, but Mary, I'm going to say you said that it had amazing sets. You know what else it had that you did not mention? What? A dirigible. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> A Zeppelin, as we like to call them. I absolutely love dirigibles. <laughs> It didn't look like the big balloons I'm used to. It looked more like a... That's because it was torpedo. a dirigible, Mary. That's oh. a rigid airship. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Do we have Bring it back a... home. Bring it back home, Nick. I'm, I am, because I'm going to ask, before we go any farther, do we want to get the contest out of the way, Mary? Yes. The answer <laughs> was The Blob from 1958. And I expected a bazillion people to, to answer this one, and they didn't. I think they thought it was a trick. Oh, okay, Mary, you said make it an easy one. I know. I couldn't have made an easier I one know. than the blob. I even got it. I even put the blob was in the picture. <laughs> okay, so y'all just shut up when you I say, know. Nick, you make them too hard. <laughs> you know what? Shut up. Okay, so go ahead, Mary. Okay. Sorry. Okay, our first prize is the surprise package from Santi Tito. It, uh, it's going to be a surprise to us, too, so let us know what goodies are in the package so we can post them. And the winner is... hope it's not Santi Tito. Ah, Pete Stima. Oh! So congratulations, Pete. And our second prize is a DVD from Patrick Kelly. It's oh. Airplane 2, the sequel from 1982. Ooh. A faulty computer causes a passenger shuttle to head straight for the sun. Can Ted Stryker save the day and get the shuttle back on track again? Stars Lloyd Bridges, Raymond Burr, Chuck Connors, Rip Torn, and Peter Graves. I never watched that one. Well, it's a shadow of... It really is. Oh, yeah. I don't think Johnny. I don't think bear. Johnny was in the second one. I don't uh, remember Johnny. Their names. Okay, Johnny was the crazy guy in the tower, yeah. and he was yeah. in it because yeah, okay. that one has my favorite line by him, mm -hmm. which is Lloyd Bridges comes up to him and goes, "Tell me everything that's happened so far." So far, and he goes, <laughs> "Well, first the Earth cooled, then the dinosaurs oh, came, God. and they got big and fat." Then you the Arabs about came stealing and they bought Mercedes Benzes. Um, oh, yeah. That would be your answer. Yes. Yes. Well, the winner of this prize is Christopher Page. Congratulations, oh, hey. Christopher. Speaking of, speak really. of the devil. And let's see. Our third prize has been donated by Brenda McNeil. It's a DVD called The Raven from 1935. Ooh. I know. It looks really interesting. Um, this hmm. thriller was directed by Lou Landers and stars Boris Karloff, Bella Lugosi, and Lester Matthews. It's the story of a plastic surgeon obsessed with Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven and a beautiful young socialite. It looks really creepy. And the winner is... Ah, Paul Santino. Ruby. Yeah. <laughs> Do what? <laughs> Paul Ruby. Oh! Congratulations, you get a copy of The Raven from Brenda. Yay. Yay. And is that it for prizes? Well, I ain't giving nothing away. Okay, well, I guess that's it for prizes then. <laughs> 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 I did text you and you didn't answer me, so I had to ask. I forgot whether I answered you or not, Mary. So, But no, I'm not giving anything away. And I will proudly proclaim that on this week's episode of the podcast. <sighs> okay. 
proud to be stingy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's like born to be wild, but only different. Way different. Okay. <laughs> okay. S- assassination Bureau. <laughs> yes. What? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, hosts. <laughs> Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Why me? Okay, um, fine. It, it was a merry choice, right? No, it was, no, a it Nick was choice. my choice. Okay, Nick, jump in there, baby. Why did well, you pick this one? Okay, so here was the thing. I have had that movie on my to do list forever. <clears throat> and I finally, I was like, you know what? I want to watch this film. I think we needed a movie for the next episode of the podcast. And I was like, Let's do the Assassination Bureau. And sure enough, it fit. And I tell you what really inspired me to uh, to do the Assassination Bureau was I watched The Great Race with Tony Curtis from 1965 mm. again recently. Hmm. And that is, you know, I mean, they dedicate the film to the spirit of Laurel and Hardy at the uh, beginning of the movie. And that movie is just, it's very slapstick comedy. It's very much a product of the 60s, even though it's set in the 20s. And, you know, it's it's just, it was a fun little film. And I was actually saying to Fiona as I was watching it, I was like, you know, they really don't make movies like this anymore. They just don't do comedies like this. You know, everything's a bit different. Mm. It's a bit edgier. It's a bit raunchier, raunchier yeah. you know, this, that, and the other. And I'm not trying to be, ah, the old man, they don't make them like they used to. You know, things change. I'll, I'll but... take that role. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, oh, I got you. That took me a second there. But, and that got me thinking, you know, I want to watch the Assassination Bureau. It is set a little bit earlier in the century than the Great Race. But I felt like it would have a similar feel, although darker. And I was right. (laughs) It's not slapstick. uh, It's not slapstick, though it does have some elements of slapstick to it. Yeah. You know, and I would particularly say that with the way they do the bombs and everything else. Because, you know, stuff blows up and, yeah, it's not... It's not like the violent, deadly explosions of modern films. It's more like, ah, an explosion happens, and we just show an explosion that takes up the whole screen, and then we don't show the bloody aftermath of it, because we're polite. Yes. (laughs) I was was glad they did that. You know, and and, and it 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 was a fun movie, and it was exactly what I expected. What I didn't expect, and I didn't realize at the time when I picked it, was just how much of the cast was involved in, uh, you know, the uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service Bond (laughs) film, which was released the same year. I know. You know, that was, yeah, that was surprising to me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think the reason they're not making them anymore is they're so expensive to make. I mean... Wow, they went everywhere in Europe. That had to be expensive. I think well, the last time they tried something like this was a film called Rat Race, which is kind yeah. of a riff on Mad, 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 Mad World. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. uh, crazy billionaire hides something, makes people go hunt it. Uh, and it has but, an all star uh, cast. Yes, mm-hmm. all cast of thousands. Yes. Uh, there are so, so many character actors in this that I recognize from other things. Mm. Well, and, you know, Diana Rigg, at the point when they did this film, and I, I start with her because I would argue that she was the biggest the biggest actor involved in the movie at the time because the Avengers, that was at the height of the Avengers, and, you know, she was, this was like doing her first very movie, well. Though. I think it's her first movie where she had a starring role. Well, I don't know if it was her first film with the, as a starring role, but I mean, I know she was the Bond girl in uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service immediately after, after that. Yeah. I mean, both films came out in 1969. 
Yeah. And then, of course, Telly Savalas was in both films. And I think, you know, a lot of folks say that his breakout role, what really made him a star was being Blofeld in that. Hmm. And then, interestingly enough, Terrence Young didn't work on either of the films, but he kind of was adjacent to them because he directed three of the Bond films and he was originally set to direct or to direct on her majesty's secret service but he ended up leaving the project and he was a producer on the assassination bureau he and was? so i thought that was interesting i didn't realize he was yeah so like i said that was kind of the link that wasn't obvious yeah and i mean both films had uh, united artist had a hand in them well, yeah, yeah, that's true. Although yeah. it started out as Paramount. Yeah. Until they couldn't get What's-His-Face, the actor. Oh, that narrows it down, Mary. The <sighs> actor they couldn't get in 1969. That could have been, it was that uh, Charlton Heston? <laughs> it was Burt Lancaster. Oh. Yeah. Ah. So, so they United, got Oliver Reed instead. United Artists announced Burt Lancaster starring the film, and when he pulled out, the film rights reverted to Paramount. And that's when it was made by Basil Dearden and Michael Ralph yeah. in their 25th film together. Oh, wow. And, okay, I may be wrong here, but I think this may have been Basil Dearden's last film, that he'd feature film that he'd completed. Yeah. Because he died in a car, car accident, accident like a year and a half later. Yeah. Yeah. But somebody else is in this movie died from a car accident. Oh, the guy, okay. He had, he was one of the character actors. He just, he was a, one of the bureau members, Roger Delgado. Okay. He's the one that used to, he was the first actor to play the master in Doctor Who in 63. Okay. And he played it from, uh, he played it in the 71 serial Terror of the Oddens. Wait, and what? Say he, that again? He played the role of the doctor from 1971 Terror of the Autons. To the seventy-three serial frontier in space. Oh, okay. And it was he, he. They specifically created the Doctor just because for him. The producer <clears throat> Barry Letts really liked him, but he died on location in Turkey because he was shooting La Cloche Tibian, the Tibetan Bell, in a German Franco television miniseries, and he was killed with two film technicians when his car went off the road into a ravine. Hmm. And John Pertwee remarked that Delgado's death was one of the reasons he decided to leave Doctor Who the following year. Wow. Yeah. I had no idea of that. And I couldn't even tell you which one he was in the Bureau. I can't. Well. I don't remember seeing his face, but then, I, you know, it's been a long time since I've seen those original Doctor Whos. Now that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so he died from a car accident, too. Well, Later. okay, and I forgot one other bit of Bond-related trivia. Ah, yes, what? Kurt Jurgens, who played the uh, the German general, I think it was General von Pinkt, or Pinkt, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, he was uh, he was Blofeld in, uh, oh God, which Bond film was that? I want to say it was Spy, not Spy, was it? Yeah, The Spy Who Loved Me. Okay. So we had two Blofelds and a Bond girl. Hmm. And there's the, the only... there's the name of your next punk rock band. <laughs> oh my God, that would be an awesome. You know, I would totally listen to that punk rock band, but only if Rigor Mortis Kitty opened for them. Uh, okay. Two Blofelds and a Bond girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like okay, that. so Mary, Mary, by the way, gentle listeners, <laughs> uh, and yes, I'm stealing gentle listeners from Bill. You're um, stealing I, my catchphrase? Oh, I know. Right in front of me? Wait a minute, right we'll get God. sued. Okay, Bill, this is the thing. I am not somebody to stab you in the back. I will stab you in the front. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm going to spit in your bourbon on Friday night, too. <laughs> and... That just adds a little bit of flavor, baby. Let me tell you. So, but now, uh, yeah, here's the thing, folks. Mary is on drugs tonight. <laughs> True. And 
and wine. And wine. And so I'm just happy that she's <laughs> not singing or doing something else right now. Please so do not try this at home. Mary. If, you, if you hear me snoring, you'll know if everything finally kicked in. Now and the back pain stopped. The people listening to the podcast, but that's <laughs> beside the point. <laughs> As you all know, I am getting back surgery next month, so I am in pain. I can't wait for it to be over. I want them to put in one of those like Battlestar Galactica Cylon red glowing spines in your back. Ooh. That's what I want. That would be <laughs> terrifying. I love it. <laughs> It'd be awesome. <laughs> I already Absolutely. have enough metal in my body. I don't know. I have a hard <laughs> enough time getting through bomb detectors and metal detectors. And... Not only do the Cylons have a plan, but Mary has a plan. Mm. That's mm. right. No, that's a lie. That's a lie. Well, no, Mary has a plan. It's called Medicare. <laughs> oh, Mar- <laughs> what? <laughs> Mary, Mary's plan is just go with the flow. Hey. Whatever happens, happens. Now, seriously, happens. though, Mary, we are all wishing you good luck <laughs> with surgery. Thank you. And, Me you know, <laughs> if they, here's the thing, they're doing back surgery on you. They've already done the hip surgeries, right? Both of them, yeah. I'm right. Pr- I'm so pretty much turning into a cyborg. Well, nice. you're turning into the bionic woman. Yes. And here's the other thing with the back surgery. Yeah. Okay. Here's the thing. Yes. The bionic man, the bionic woman bionic whatever they would give them super fast robot legs and super strong robot arm or whatever Mm -hmm. they didn't give them super strong spinal column that's true so you know all i can think of every time i see steve austin lift a car up with his arm is and there goes his third vertebra (laughs) (laughs) you know and when he's running super fast all i can think of is ah there goes his neck (laughs) I never thought about it in that much detail before, but um, you have a Well, point. that's what happens when you have a lot of time on your hands, uh, Mary. Okay. And I don't, so I don't know why I thought of it. <laughs> Bourbon. That, that That's entirely possible. <laughs> Nick was a latchkey kid. It was his babysitter during the mm. time. Okay. Actually, you are pretty much spot on because... Uh, when I was growing up in the summers, the local ABC affiliate would get something from the 1970s TV roster and put it on in the afternoons. And this was circa 1982 to 1984. Oh my goodness. So, and one of the things they would get would be the the Six Million Dollar Man series. Hmm. Another would be Battlestar Galactica, the OG Battlestar Galactica. You know, with Richard Hatch and Dirk yeah. Benedict. And uh, the other one would be the Buck Rogers show. So, you know, wow. all of these were fantastic for a teenage boy in the early 80s. Hmm. Hello, Aaron Gray. But, Indeed. Uh... <laughs> you nailed. Okay, Bill, you and I are on too much of the same page because you nailed my my Uber crush out of all three of those. Well, that was the. Just, uh, I'm just that disappointed was that once again my youth has become vintage for you kids. Uh, uh, yeah, kids today with their vintage stuff. Yeah, we tied an onion on our belt because it was the thing to do back in the day. That's yeah. right. That okay, you. back to the assassination. Oh yeah. Topic. Oh, yeah, we, we got a movie, home, the Assassination Bureau. We totally, wow. So, <laughs> who else was in it, Mary? We um, talked about Diana Rigg a little bit. The, and we talked the, about that fellow you can't remember from Doctor Who. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oliver Reed. There you Oliver go. Reed. Yes. Has he been in anything else? I don't recognize him. <laughs> He's one of those young up and coming actors back in the day. Uh, is he still yeah. alive? No. No, he died no. in two thousand or ninety nine, okay. actually. He died like right after Gladiator. I think that was his last oh, film role. That's right. Yeah. He's, he's the one that had a he had stopped drinking, but he did, was doing the gladiator and he binge drank at some bar oh, somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And and he ended up having a heart attack or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He had but like a six hundred dollar bar had, bill or something. Yeah, he had finished his scenes for Gladiator, I believe. 
But um, it was after he downed three bottles of Captain Morgan's. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Wow. That man, he died like he lived. No <laughs> oh, kidding. Man. That Ger- boy loved his juice, yeah. Plus oh, my God. Eight he bottles was... of German beer. Doubles oh, of, yeah. Doubles of famous gross, gross whiskey and Hennessy cognac. Goodness. Now, he left quite the bar tab was what I think you were saying. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, oh, well. Yeah. And he, uh, they actually dedicated Gladiator to his memory. I don't remember so, him in Gladiator. Yeah, he, he was, played one uh, of the older Gladiator trainers or something like oh, that. Okay. Yeah, I will always was, remember him for Curse of the Werewolf, oh, which yeah. scared the absolute crap out of me back in the day. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh yeah, the crazy guy that gets locked away forever, and then. You know, rapes the mute girl. It, oh God, that oh, for little Billy, that was yikes. Yeah, yeah, that's and that's you know a, that was one of those werewolf movies where they really just kind of took a real hard left at the origin mm-hmm. of werewolves. At it. <laughs> hard <laughs> left at Albuquerque for sure. We, but exactly. it was good. It, it's a classic movie. I love it. But we boy, need back to do that great. one. We really need to do that one. Have we done it before? Uh, as a matter of fact, we have done it, Mary. I was going to say, I'd be surprised if you hadn't. <laughs> yeah, Oops. Mary. Um, I yeah, don't remember. God bless. I well, this know. is 513 episodes, oh. so they're just going to blur after a while. They do. And that's okay, <laughs> Mary. But yeah, I mean, he did so many movies, and a lot of them are very interesting films. Like, he did ZPG. Did you ever hear of that one, Mary? No. no. What Zero is it? population growth. Huh. And that was from the early 70s. It was one of those dystopian future movies. Mm-hmm. And in this one, couples are not allowed to have children because they're trying to keep the Earth's population down mm-hmm. because of overpopulation. And he and his wife decide that they're going to have a baby. And... It's against the law, and they give you these little robot dolls to simulate children, yeah, and yes. you know it's just it's a uh, it's a pretty grim film actually, but it's very interesting to watch, you know. Oh, and again, it's some it. of that dystopian, soylent green type uh, future, dark Earth future movies. Hmm. Yeah, he did Tommy. Is that from yeah? The- from the, from the, the who? opera Who? I huh. believe so. Huh. Very interesting. Huh. Yeah. That was the one based on The Who. Okay. So hmm. there's another tie-in. First, we had a guy who was in Doctor Who. Then we had a guy who's in a movie based on The Who. <laughs> <laughs> See, look, I can make connections oh, no. where they really don't exist. Your yes. synapses are firing on all cylinders, baby. <sighs> Something's firing, that's for sure. <laughs> no, but I tell you, one of my one of my actual favorite roles, though, for uh, Oliver Reed was uh, when he was in the Three Musketeers back in the seventies. Oh heck yeah! You know that was just that was good old fashioned swashbuckling, <laughs> super fun. Michael Yorkian, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, is that the one where he got stabbed in the throat during the windmill duel and almost died? I believe so. <laughs> And he later came back, but he must have got paid pretty well because he came back for the four musketeers four, yeah. in '74. <sighs> yep. Oh, and he also did another better. weird movie with uh, with babies. Which one? He did The Brood from 1979. Hmm. And that's another. That was a David Cronenberg film, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, weren't we just talking about Scanners recently, Bill? Yes, because that was my episode on Bill Watches Movies last month. With Scanners. That's right, because I was listening to it, and that <laughs> was, that was I was listening to your episode because I had literally just watched the movie, and I was like, <laughs> oh my God, what a coincidence. It makes me very happy that you listen to my show. 
I did. You, you, I, dude, I could listen to you read a read a grocery list. You have such a good voice. Mm-hmm. You're very kind. Hey. Well, he also did The Devils. Yeah. So, well, and okay, Mary, can you name another movie that he was in that we did on the podcast? No. No, no not a chance. Burnt <laughs> Offerings. Oh, yeah. We there you did go. that movie? Yes, we did. Good Lord, Mary. <laughs> Lord. What was it about? Well, there were these offerings, and they got <laughs> burnt. It's like burnt ends, but different. Uh, okay, Mary, it's the one where the, ha- the where the family, Oliver Reed being the dad, goes to live in the house for the summer. And while they're in the house... Uh, They've got Karen Black as his wife, and he's got, uh, what was it, Burgess Meredith is like one of the neighbors, and his son is there, and Betty Davis is the aunt, and everybody in the house starts going kind of cuckoo, and it turns out that the house is looking to kill them because it needs a blood sacrifice in order to stay healthy as a house. Wow. I mean, it's really weird, but as he as people get killed, the house problems with the house fix themselves huh yeah I wish and the problems you know with my I, house would fix themselves i was gonna say it makes me tempted to invite people i don't like over <laughs> <laughs> if if that was a way i mean think about that man <laughs> like the the home renovation shows would go a whole different way if that were the case mm. yeah i'm just saying Ugh. yeah Okay, fine. So we're going to stop listing movies with Oliver Reed, and we're going to talk about somebody else who was in the film. Diana Rigg. Diana Rigg. Now, we did talk about her briefly, but uh, yeah. Loves me some... Oh, go ahead, Bill. Sorry. Oh, no, I said I'm just I'm playing the guessing game. Telly Savalas. Oh. Well, I was yes. thinking about that, but if we want to talk about Diana Rigg some more, we can, because, you know, I love Diana Rigg. I know. I loved her in Game of Thrones. Yeah. She yep. was, uh, that was one of her last roles, too. Yeah. Yeah. You know. But, I never uh, saw Last Night oh, in God. Soho. That was her final film film. Theatrical yeah. film. Not television. Well, I was going to say, okay, wait, Game of Thrones was not, uh, that was a TV television. show, yeah. Mary. Yeah. So, so that was last her last, uh, yeah. And actually, her last film film, she apparently had a role in Last Night in, in Soho. Soho from 2021. That's what I just said. Didn't I say that? Or did I think I said that? I think you thought you said that, <laughs> oh, Mary. Lord. I didn't hear it. Okay. <laughs> I need some more wine. Oh, okay, Mary. That is exactly what you don't need. <laughs> Do you need more wine or less wine? Always more. Always Do you need more. a hot cup of coffee would be no. more accurate. But, no, no, no. But yeah, no, she was working and working hard up until her death. She said she didn't want to retire. She could find no reason for it. She loved working. Mm-hmm. And and yeah. that's excellent. Yeah. And by the way, did you uh, did you notice that she was in an episode of Doctor Who? Yes. With her daughter. Yeah. Yeah. The Crimson Whore. I remember that yeah. one. Because I was really surprised to see her. Mary, you don't remember what episodes we did on the uh, podcast, so I'm not surprised you don't remember. No, I do remember that one. I love Doctor Who, the the latest incarnation of it. Okay, and just so people know that I do like things that don't necessarily involve violence, horror movies, or science fiction, she was also in one of my favorite little short episode run TV series out of Britain, the detectorists, huh. hmm. which That's is a, one. which is just a heartwarmingly sweet little comedic show about two metal detector guys. Oh running gosh. Around. I've seen, okay. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. And I just, I love that show to bits. There's not an episode of it. I don't like, and Mackenzie crook, uh, who everybody knows is one of the uh, henchmen from Pirates of the Caribbean. Yes, he is yeah. wonderful. He is, and he was actually the show's creator. Oh, hmm. that's, and it was Toby. Yeah, uh, Toby uh, Jones. Yes, uh, it's it is. You are absolutely right. Thanks for bringing that up. That's a wonderful little yeah. show. Yeah, 
I just love that show to bits. And there is, it is just such a nice little show. I like Toby <laughs> Jones. He is such a good character actor. Yeah. Well, and have you seen The Detectorists, Mary? No. I wonder. I have BritBox. I wonder if I can get it on there. Well, you I probably so. can. And I highly recommend it. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And if for nothing else, it's a it's a little show, but it has great cinematography, great sound design, great musical score, and it is very well acted. It's very much a slice of life in a small town. It's very interesting. She, absolutely. Yep, she yep. was in that? Wait, what? She was... Which yes, is, Diana Rigg, she played the mother of uh, Mackenzie Crook's wife. Oh, okay. So she was the mother-in-law. Okay. Mm-hmm. Huh. Cool. Yep. So anyway, that's her. Now let's go to Telly Savalas. <laughs> I got to admit, when the when he first came on the screen, you know, I'm used to Who Loves You, Baby. I am used to Kojak era <laughs> Telly Savalas. Yeah, I am a child of the 70s. And when that upper class British accent, you know, mustache twirling villain, snipely whiplash kind of voice came out of Telly Savalas's bald head, I was like, what? I know, right? (laughs) And this was okay. (laughs) This and when he was when he plays the Cossack in Horror Express. Yeah are two of my favorite just really, really random Telly Savalas performances. Yeah, because he was just super fun in this as as the villainous member of the Assassination Bureau. Yes. And it well, he was Lord Bostwick, that was it. And it's funny that you can have a villainous member of the Assassination Bureau and a quasi-heroic member of the Assassination Bureau, i.e. Oliver Reed's character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was fun. And, you know, we'll touch on that during the uh, synopsis and stuff, but... I was really surprised that Telly Savalas, because I only really knew about him through Kojak. Thank you. And I didn't realize how many movies he had done before Mm that. Oh my god, dude is... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude has been in everything yeah i mean he was yeah and if you look at just not just everything but he did so many classic movies too true you know now yeah. one of my favorites is kelly's heroes obviously yeah. mm-hmm. but you know he did the uh, like we said he was blofeld in uh honor majesty's secret service you know he uh and i mean he did a lot of tv show runs I mean, hell, he even showed up on an episode of The Love Boat, I mm-hmm. think. But, yeah, that <laughs> didn't was everybody? Of, yes. I was going to say didn't everybody that was, ex- that, until the yeah. t- the great Ted McGinley uh, controversy, which eventually killed the show. The well, Ted McGinley curse. The what? Ted McGinley curse. <laughs> what are you talking about? In the seventies, whenever they needed to, you know, punch up a show a bit, every once in a while they would pick Ted McGinley to come on the show. He was kind of your stereotypical, uh, good-looking, feathered hair, tanned Ken doll that would go around on shows. And, you know, every time they would bring Ted McGinley on as a cast member, you know, late in the run of a show, the show would inevitably die. And The Love Boat was one of those shows. <laughs> yeah. The Ted McGinley wow. curse. Thank you very much. Now, you're totally on it. Um now, one of his weirder roles was the Dirty Dozen. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because he played that, like, religious serial killer that was one of the Dirty Dozen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was, you know, the, okay, his his character was the only one of the Dirty Dozen uh, army guys that I was like, oh, thank God the Nazis got him. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wow. And you know it's bad when you're rooting for the Nazis. <laughs> okay. That's... In their and defense, the way, they were very snappy dressers. So, well, yeah. that's true. <laughs> you go, boss. <laughs> God, <no. laughs> Serious. But, 
I, I know that's the thing. They were the best dressed up, mm-hmm. the best dressed forces out there, but yeah, it doesn't make to... them any less evil. Right. <laughs> I'm going to weigh in here. I think I'm the only one of the three of us that are in this room that did not like this movie. What? Exactly. No, Uh, give give it up, man, because I'm curious. Yes. To me, uh, I went in cold. I had never heard of this movie before. I brought no baggage to it. I brought no expectations other than the assassination bureau. It must be a bureau that assassinates people. That's literally what I brought in. And, you know, Diana Rigg, good. Yeah, Mrs. Peel, got it. You know, Oliver Reed, oh, yeah, Curse of the Werewolf, okay, check. Uh, But, boy, I just, uh, no. I I, I knew from the beginning it was going to be so over the top. And so, I, you know, it reminded me of, Abominable Doctor Fives. Okay, there was it's that sixties kind of yeah, the it's colors that and... kind of self-aware, over-the-top satire, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, type thing, and I, I just did not like this movie. It, it I was fast-forwarding, I was pausing, I oh, was wandering no. aimlessly. Uh, I just could not get into it. Now, Mary mentioned the comparison to. It's a mad, 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 mad world, Mm -hmm. which I adore. See, that's the American version, though. There's a disconnect here somewhere between mad, 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 mad world and Assassination Bureau. I haven't quite figured out what it is. It's British humor. It's a drier humor. I, I get British humor, but this was not it. I... I bet that Oliver Reed and Diana Rigg, they had a blast filming this. You can just tell that, you know, there are certain strengths that the movie has, and the leads is one. The leads is absolutely one. Mm-hmm. You could just tell that they had a great time filming this. The sets are gorgeous. The mm-hmm. music is wonderful. The art direction, the cinematography, everything. But, you know... I've find it, I find it hard to believe that the guy who wrote, you know, White Fang and Sinclair Lewis, who wrote <laughs> The Jungle and some guy named Robert Fish, you know, I just think they have too many cooks in the kitchen when it came to the script for this. Because, uh, you know, maybe I wasn't in the mood for it, but uh, this it, it, it's like I, it's like eating chocolate cake and it's so sweet and it's so decadent and you can't make a meal of it well i guess some people can make a meal of chocolate cake yes. but uh, <laughs> the, you know it's the sugar content of this film it's the high caloric count it's the you know diabetes you know wilford brimley kind of ooh. it's i just could not get into the spirit of this movie at all oh. despite its strengths despite its strengths but for after a while i just did not care you know, it's 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 fun to see them gallivanting around, and I've never seen more spiked helmets in one gathering. You know, yeah. it, uh, but this movie was just not for me, and uh, I'm gonna be billing the B movie cast for two hours of my time. Oh, oh no! <laughs> Aww. Oh, that's all right, baby. I've made you. I've brought movies to the table that you hated, so it's all good. I was say, Mary, but this is a Nick I, choice, so I'm going to blame Nick specifically no, for this. This one is all me, and I own it. <laughs> I, I okay. expected it. I I didn't want to watch it because it was Assassination Bureau. I thought it was going to be a very uh, spy I was story. Like I a thought John was, Le Carre, Smiley's yeah, People, yeah. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Right. I'm like, oh, right. Mrs. P. You know, I brought. Well, a see, certain I amount didn't of expectation like that. to it, but uh, I, d- I didn't want it to be that. So that I guess it's why I, I liked it because it wasn't yeah, that. I okay. Did. Now and, I would pay. I would have paid good money for it, like a seriously well done, you know, Jean Le Carre, Ian Fleming, uh, yeah. Oliver Reed, you know, Emma Peel. Man, I'd been all over that, but this one was just just not me. Well, and. You know, you brought up a point about the fact that it may have had too many cooks in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, Jack London started the novel. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm going to guess he got about, as you said in the trivia, Mary, he got about two thirds of the way through it and just didn't know where to take it. Yeah. I bet if you go back and read the novel, it is much more of a Tinker Tailor soldier yeah. spy yeah. or a much darker, more dramatic piece. Mm-hmm. But they and really farced it up. They yeah. did. They farced it mm-hmm. up. And it's interesting mm-hmm. because they actually shot the film in 1968. Mm-hmm. And Paramount, I guess, who had you know some of the control over it, like we said, they didn't want to release it. In the U.S., but didn't, didn't they didn't they try to sell it as a tent pole? You yeah, know, they were is, going to, yeah. and then they were like, "Oh, this is this is a problem because mm-hmm. the name yeah. of the movie was problematic." Yeah, it was to me too. That's why I was expecting a really dark spy story. And I was, and mm-hmm. I think that's why this film kind of fell into a bit of obscurity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, you know because you would think with the cast that's involved. And the production value, the set design. I mean, all the things that, you know, Bill brought out as The pedigree positives. is there. The mm-hmm. pedigree is there. Absolutely. But yeah. Boy. And, but the film just disappeared. And I think part of it is because people who did see it were thinking of it as Bill was. Yeah. Which is odd. This has got, you know, Oliver Reed in it. It's got Diana Rigg. Diana Rigg's in the Avengers. Mm -hmm. We're expecting something maybe James Bond-esque. Yeah. Or more serious than James Bond, because even, you know, even the Connery Bond films were a bit tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, but this, uh, this was definitely, you know, this was sort of the... The original David uh, David Niven version of Casino Royale. You, you took the words right out of my mouth. You know, Nick, it's weird that that is exactly what I was just getting ready to mention. That if they had come up with something like that in the Casino Royale vein with these two actors, it would have knocked it out of the park. I think it would yeah. have been received differently. But also during this time, I think it is the end of the period piece. You know, you've True. already had, you know... A huge costumed, uh, you know, cast of thousands. And, you know, maybe during this time, uh, you know, costume period pieces may have been a really hard sell as well. If they had brought it into the 60s, you know, you couldn't even gone a little Austin Powersy, you know, that type yeah. of spy mm-hmm. farce, I think, would have been much better served. But uh, despite the actors and everyone involved, you know, period piece heavily satirical, heavily farcical, tongue in cheek. It's it's a hard sell. Like I can no. I can only imagine Paramount's conundrum. Yeah, and I can also only imagine the accountants at Paramount's mm-hmm. conundrum. Oh when yeah, because this was an expensive one, I bet. Oh, oh yeah, been. this had to be. And I, I've actually had some trouble tracking down the budget numbers for this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and and okay, I'll be blunt. I'm not willing to shell out fifteen dollars a month to be an IMDb Pro member. Yeah, me either. And <laughs> you know, so I can't get the dollar value for it. But I'm going to bet they lost their shirts on this movie. Oh, absolutely. Especially if yeah. they propped it up at an investors meeting as a tent pole or a possible tent pole. Yeah. Oh man. I don't know. Because they'll they'll throw extra money at something like that. But boy, yikes. Yeah. And and I totally get why you didn't like it. I'll be honest. I thought it was going to be the other way around. I thought Mary was going to be the one that hated it. <laughs> wow. And I thought, oh, well, you know, you'll like it. And oops, I was wrong. You know, that's and that's, right, that's OK. A, I, I still love you. It's all good. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, man. And, you know, this is the thing. I also think this film was done at the back in the days of the Batman television series. Mm, yeah. And this fit, this could have been an episode of Batman almost. It really could have. Yeah. 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 All it needed know. was Biff and bang and pow. Yeah. That's why I was more of a green Hornet guy back during the <laughs> Batman days. I was more of no. a green Hornet guy. See, and I can see that too. And I, I, don't get. I love the Green Hornet. I mean, you know, they had, you know, the, the let's face had it, Bruce, Kato, Bruce freaking Lee. Yeah, I know. Cato stole the show always. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I think if I remember right, they had to tone down a lot of his stuff because it they was did. too impressive. 
<laughs> wow. It's like, uh, you're making the Green Hornet look bad, Kato. Come on, stop <laughs> it. I don't know. Uh, I just, I think it's because it was made in the 60s and it, and it Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band and, and Yellow Submarine kind of, it had that feeling to it to me. The only thing well, I didn't like were the, like. Oh my gosh, this is the episode, this is the longest episode of the monkeys. There you go. That's yeah. it. <laughs> no, seriously. Only think set, about the attitude. Set in 1901 or 1908. Yeah, it is. It's, no. All you needed was Davy, Peter, Mike, and M- Mickey, and you know, but it's that zaniness. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not head it, monkeys. It, it, it's the TV show monkeys. It it's never different... broke that. What the third, fourth, cur- third fourth wall. curtain? Fourth curtain. Yeah. What is that? The fourth wall. Fourth, wall. fourth wall. Yeah. It never yeah, did yeah. that. It did. But boy, they could have. No, no he breaks it, it at the very end. He breaks it at the very end. At the end. very oh, end. Oh, okay. Right yeah. at yeah. us. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, he didn't do going. it through the whole movie, so. No, 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 no. I just, just didn't like the caricatures of, you know, like the German did this and the Russian was like this. Mm-hmm. And that part I didn't care for. That was for. supposed to be part of the appeal, I guess. Yeah, That's I guess. The slapstick. Yeah, because yeah. you could laugh at them or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Well, and, you know, I, you know, it's funny you mentioned the uh, Russian because Oliver Reed's character was Ivan Dragomoff. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, that's just about the most Russian sounding name I could imagine. Mm-hmm. And he totally did not play it like he was a Russian because they had a different fellow who was the uh, Russian in it. Yeah. You know, yeah. but. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because the film, you would think it would have been more about assassinations and violence. It really, though, to me, came across as more of a satire on politics yes. and stuff than anything else. I also you thought know. it was going to turn in. I thought it was going to be more assassinations as well with Oliver Reed, you know, wearing 16 different disguises to assassinate yeah. each of the people before they assassinated him. Yeah. But, uh, they unfortunately, really didn't no. Play the, yeah, <laughs> they didn't play that card up very much at all, actually. They I mean, they, 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 they did more of the story behind the story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that Telly Savalas trying to take over the Assassination yeah. Bureau. That was more well, the story of the movie. Yeah. And, and, I mean, that's an interesting idea because you had... You know, this, yeah, and, okay, bear in mind, I had literally just watched The Great Race. That was part of what made me think, because I actually started to go, hey, maybe we ought to do The Great Race. I was like, nah, man, I think we ought to do the Assassination Bureau, because I haven't, I've been wanting to watch that. And I was like, this will be, you know, my, this will be something I haven't seen so let's watch the Assassination Bureau because I watched the Great Race. The Great Race is a movie I go back to maybe wow. once every five or six years and watch wow. because it's super slapstick comedy, mm-hmm. very Laurel and Hardy. And see, I don't this care for is, that much. Well, and that's why see, I kind of like this better. Well, that's the thing. This isn't as much of the slapstick aspect, yeah. but what I did notice was a common thread in it was Diana Riggs character, you know, uh, so Sonia Winter was a she was a woman who wanted to be a reporter in a man's world and all mm-hmm. this suffrage and, yeah. And that was exactly what Natalie Wood's character was doing in uh The Great Race. Oh, okay. Hmm. And you know, just like her character, she got a you know, uh Diana Riggs character gets a new a big newspaper to bankroll her expose on the assassination bureau, just like Natalie Wood's character got a big newspaper to bankroll her entry in the great race so she could report on it. Oh, okay. So, so there you go. I'm just drawing (laughs) my little lines, connecting everything together. You got one of those red string walls where you're just putting red thread all over the place. Oh, let me tell you, I got that. I, the wall behind me here in the office is a picture of Oliver Reed next to a picture of Captain Morgan's rum. 
<laughs> and there's a whole bunch of red lines going between those, and then everything else branches out from that. And then we have <laughs> Natalie Wood, and then we have Robert Walker, and then we have Christopher Walken. Yep, and then we have uh, somehow or other Kevin Bacon. Yes. Because he always shows up in these things. <laughs> See, Mary's laughing, but, yeah. you know, it's true. By the way, I kind of She's forgot. She's drunken on drugs. But yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, I could wish that I was in such shape, but I digress. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because I also, I mentioned Kurt Jurgens as the, uh, you know, the Blofeldy character, the, uh, you know, the the big bad in. He wasn't Blofeld, actually, in uh, The Spy Who Loved Me. He was, oh, God, whatever that dude's name was that was the one that wanted to flood the Earth. Because uh, that was one of the first where we're just going to destroy the whole planet so that my group of people can repopulate it or whatever. But, uh, yeah, he was Stromberg in that. But, yeah, it's it's funny because there were actually two other guys – Vernon uh, Dobchkoff and Milton uh, Reed were also in The Spy Who Loved Me, and they were both in the Assassination Bureau. Mm -hmm. So this movie was just all sorts of Bond. True. There, there's, I've just gone down another rabbit hole. Sorry. There's a character actor named Frank Thornton in this. He was one of the... He was like the second victim, I think, in the whole movie. Yeah. But he was... He's a really great character actor, and he was in um, who, who Are You Being Served? Hmm. It was a British comedy series from, Lord, probably the 60s, I think. Yeah, I think it was 60s. Might yeah. have been the early 70s. But... Yeah, I loved that one. But I didn't recognize it. I didn't recognize a lot of these people. Well, for one thing, they all had pointy hats on, as, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, as Bill's happy to point out. This is true. I'm going to By mention way, something that happens during the Bordello uh, portion of it. And okay. I may have been hallucinating. No, I but, know what you're about to say. Yes, I saw it too. Carry on. I swear, I swear that one of the gentleman callers at the Bordello is an uncredited Rod Steiger. Yes. A am I right? I saw him too, and you're I thought right, it was because Nashy. I saw that, and I was like, "Is that Rod Steiger?" I thought it was Nashy. Ooh, you'll have to get your B movie detectives out there on the case because I'm going with yeah. Rod Steiger. Oh, okay. Well, I tell you what, ask. Okay, you're going to be at the Monster Bash this year, Bill. Your homework assignment for the Monster Bash <laughs> is, to, is to ask Rod. I didn't know there'd be homework involved. <laughs> There's always homework involved. Get with it. Get with the program, Bill. No, but seriously, ask Rod if uh, Paul Nashi was in the Assassination <laughs> Bureau. I am not asking Rod Barnett if Paul Nashi, through some delirium of Mary's, was in the Assassination <laughs> Bureau. Come on, I'm going I, with I've Rod never seen Steiger. his name anywhere. Like they, I, I saw a whole list of people that were in there that were in a million other things and they're uncredited in this and he yeah. was not We're one of throwing, them. I'm throwing the homework out to the uh, B-Movie cast listeners to call okay. in and let us know if Bill and Nick are correct and that Rod Steiger nah. is one of the... I'm telling nah. you. I'm telling you. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. All Let's right. See. Are Bill and Nick the two sober guys who paid attention to the movie? Yes. Correct. Even one or who is hated the... the movie but still paid attention and did not yeah. show up to the recording drunk and or stoned. <sighs> yeah, Mary, um, he's calling you out pretty accurately I know. there. I know. <laughs> I think I'll just shut up for the rest of the cast. Aw, oh, Mary, you know I love you. You know I kid because I love. I know. You can't shut up, Mary. I Come know. on. It is hard. <sighs> Ah, moving along. Moving along. Beryl okay. Reed was the brothel owner. Madam, mm. she was Madame Otero. She's a character actress, and she was in the Killing a Sister George. George Kalouris was a Swiss peasant in this thing. Um, Milton Reed. Well, you said that one already. Yeah. Yeah. He was the 
third victim, the elevator victim. Yeah, which the elevator victim was one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> Because, okay, of all the victims, he was the one that was in the best mood when he fell to his death. That's true. That's true. And, and yeah, the film started with a bunch of assassinations. Yeah, it did. And I'm kind of, again, I had not seen this movie either. I just watched the preview for it. And it was on my list to watch because it had Oliver Reed, Diana Rigg, Telly Savalas. Yeah. You know, I was like, I got to check this movie out. And... The thing is, it starts with all those assassinations, and then they just kind of fizzle out, and it just goes to everybody's trying to kill Oliver Reed, and Oliver Reed is trying to kill everybody. But I like the way they they did it. I like the way I I enjoyed them trying to kill him and how he— I think they ran out of spirit gum is what I'm thinking (laughs) for all of the (laughs) fake beards and eyebrows and— you know, they just ran out. That it's like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, Paramount's gonna go even further in debt because of all the spirit gum it takes to dress up Oliver Reed. Wait, which one was the 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 heavy set guy that had the um the gourd, not the 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 sausage in the restaurant that blew up? Okay, that was that was um, what's his name, Curd. Uh... Kurd Jurgens. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, he was okay. the yeah, he was the one that put the bomb in the sausage. Okay. He was and funny. then he threw the bomb a- away when he realized he got it back. Because remember, the bomb would be triggered by contact with metal. And so the idea was when they cut into that giant sausage, which by the way I thought looked like just a big old aubergine, but that's beside the I point. I know, I did too. Yeah. You know. But yeah. uh you know, this and if I'm not mistaken, it was that bomb blowing up that co- that uh, killed the uh, the like the Archduke, the Archduke, Archduke Ferdinand, Ferdinand Dan? Yeah. <laughs> and triggered World War One <laughs> because, OK, the, when that happened and I was like, wait, that's Archduke Ferdinand. But it's and Archduke from a different Ferdinand's it, assassination is what kicked off World War One. But it was a different. Co- it was a, a different Ferdinand, I think, because it was a different country, yeah, yeah, because it's a different country, and they didn't kick off World War One, although it alluded to that being the kickoff of World yeah. War One, yeah, because that's what Telly Savalas wanted, wanted to happen, yeah, yeah, you know, and yeah, and I guess is... in history that really is supposedly what happened. What it a was... sausage exploded? No, and killed the Telly Savalas, the the. People with money wanted to make more money, and that's what started World War One. There's a there's a lot of uh, loose conspiracies that about point that, to that yeah. actually. Yeah. So you know, it wasn't Gavilo Princep that assassinated Archduke Ferdinand. It was an exploding sausage. Mm-hmm. Just for you history students out there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, and I did think it was weird that they had a. You know, Duke Ferdinand is the one that gets yes. blown up by the sausage. Mm-hmm. I know that. I that kind of pulled me out of the movie, and I started thinking sure. history. Unfortunately, that must have well, been one of those comic book alternative Earths or something yeah. like that. Earth, yeah, Earth six, Earth six sixteen or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and on Earth six sixteen, you know, this guy's death really did almost kick Mm. Europe into a world war. And that's why all these European heads of state have to go to this castle in Germany to, uh, Mm -hmm. was it Germany or it was like Rothfia or something, actually it was right near Germany, I think, but they went to a castle to have a big peace conference. And that was when the assassination bureau was going to take out all these heads of state because that would then start a major world war, which Telly Savalas's character thought would be very good for business. Because he bought up all the arms and munitions. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, this was a, that was an interesting thing, because the whole premise of the movie is that the Assassination Bureau exists to kill people to better society. Mm -hmm. So you have this thing where, yes, they have to be paid. They have to take a commission to do the to do the assassination, but they will vet 
the person that they are going to kill, they will look at, okay, what is the reason that somebody wants them dead? Do they deserve to die? Yeah. You know, is it, or is it going to be bad for the bad for everybody else if this person dies? (laughs) So So it's like Dexter only different. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. That's a good way to put it. It's like Dexter with much less serial killing, (laughs) but much less blood. Yeah, much less blood. I, you know, I don't think other than a couple of scratches from sabers, I don't think there was any blood in That's this. That's true. So, That's true. Yeah, but and that was the thing. The idea, though, was that assassination is a public service. Yes. And that's a good quote, way to put it. Yes. Yeah, to quote Tune from Remo Williams, "The Adventure oh, Begins." Yes. <laughs> assassination is the highest form of public service. I love those books. Uh, you know what? I love the books. Uh, I really like the movie. I would do that movie. That I would love to talk about. Remo Williams, The didn't, Adventure Begins, baby. Didn't we do uh, yeah. you and I'll talk, because that's on my Heck list. Yeah, but we already maybe. did it on the B-Movie cast. I thought cast. we did that, yeah. Yeah, we did. Trust okay. me. Okay. As a matter of fact... Okay, in my office, I have an original one sheet for Remo Williams' The Adventure Begins. Wow. Is one of the posters up on my wall. Wow. So that's how much I like that movie. (laughs) But I digress yet again. Yes. Okay. Um, So. There's an Air Vice that was the Swiss Bureau member. Warren Mitchell is the actor. He was in The Crawling Eye. Yeah, he was in a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, but Kenneth yeah, and Griffin I mean, was again, it? it goes to the fact that this had a this had a seriously heavy hitting main cast with yeah. Diana Rigg, Oliver Reed, Telly Savalas, uh, Kurt Jurgens, even. But it also had all of these really good character actors, supporting actors, mm-hmm. like you said, Mary, and that's what made the movie for me. That's part of what made the movie so good. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because even the small parts had a lot of uh, chops to them. Mm-hmm. Clive and, Revel is that it? That's that how you say his last name, or is it Reveal? Say, Clive. What? Clive. Oh, Revel. Clive. I say Clyde Reveal. Reveal. Okay, he yeah. was the Italian bureau member. Yeah, he was and he's with the Michael one Goffin. Whose wife, hmm? And that was an interesting little subplot there. Yeah. And I'm actually not going <laughs> to give away what happens with his wife there. <laughs> Okay. okay, because here's the thing, and gentle listeners, yeah, I stole it again, Bill. Um, curse okay. you, curse you, Nick. <laughs> I know, curse, curse, curse. But, okay, seriously, go watch the movie if you're interested. Just go into it forewarned that, as Bill learned, this is not a serious movie no. about assassinations True. and political intrigue. It's common. This isn't even a Dr. Strangelove style satire. This is a farce. Yeah, it's a farce. It's borderline, uh, you know, it's borderline slapstick, but it's not, it doesn't quite cross into it, but it's borderline slapstick. It's much more, uh, like the great race, as I mentioned. I I feel like I'm drawing a lot of parallels to that film with this. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I liked his character. I mean, I thought he did it really really well and I was really surprised at, at how much he's been in. Cuz I didn't really recognize him and I looked him up and he's been in so much stuff. Uh, the Legend of Hell House. Um Avanti, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights, Dracula Dead and Loving It. I mean, he's been in so much stuff. Hmm. I this this character actors are just amazing me. Well, remember, Mary, this is the other thing. When you have a character actor, that generally means they are not getting paid a fortune to be in the movie. That's true. You know, when you've got Tom Cruise is your leading man in a movie. He makes enough money on any one film he does that he could just retire and never act again afterwards. Yes. And he would not be doing badly. True. Right? True. 
these character actors are generally speaking working actors. Mm-hmm. So they're, I'm not saying they're living poor, but they aren't living, you know, <laughs> nobody, nobody made enough money as a star of this film yeah. to retire afterwards would be yeah. my guess. Hmm. I wonder how much he paid Telly Savalas. Four dollars and a lollipop. <laughs> and that, that's true. He really did have the lollipop because he was trying to quit smoking. Yeah. But I not just in thought this that film. Was, well, yeah, I just thought that was a... That is a very good piece of trivia, Mary, and you dropped it in there with absolutely no context. I know. But luckily, well, you did say tell we us knew about, what we you were, were talking, talking about. about Telus so... <laughs> Uh, Maybe I should start doing that. What, lollipops, lollipops instead of cigarette smoking? Yeah. I'm not going to say you shouldn't because smoking <laughs> is a terrible thing and hey, it will I kill even, you. I even got those patches, so. Yeah, well, you know what you're not yet. supposed to do, Mary? You are not supposed to use them all at once. <laughs> and I know you, Mary. You'll be like, I need I another know. smoke. And I, you know, Stick another it, patch on. You'll end up with like 15 patches and your skin <laughs> will turn green. That's kind of what I'm afraid of. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's because you would turn into a tobacco plant, but that's beside the point. <laughs> I'd fit in with the rest of my house. Your house is full of tobacco plants? It's full of plants. Plant huh. plants. You've seen that's my true. house. It looks like a jungle. So, any other actors we want to talk about from this flick? Because... I think we kind of hit everybody. I think we did. I think we're good. Yeah. All right. Well, that's cool. Do we want to go ahead and do the uh, synopsis? E. Okay. All right. So check it, folks. It's uh, circa 1908, and uh, there's an aspiring journalist and obviously woman's rights campaigner. And I say obviously because that seemed to be a theme in these period pieces from that period also. And that's Sonia Winter, and she's played by Diana Rigg. And she has worked out a connection between all of the murders that happened during the opening of this film. She's managed to link them all together. And the film starts out with kind of this little bit of narration talking about the fact that, you know, murder up to this point or assassination really was an assassination. It was just kind of clumsy accidental killings. And then suddenly, all of the killings became much more precise and much more targeted. And they were having political, geopolitical effects, right? And the whole idea is that, aha, there is a bureau that is behind the assassinations. And journalist Sonia Winter, uh, Diana Rigg, has figured out the link between all of these. And she goes to the guy who owns the newspaper that she's wanting to write for. And she says, look, hire me to write this story. I've figured out the links and I will bring you this story. Well, Savalas, he's kind of coy. And he says, look, come back here. I don't want to make all the uh, men nervous by hiring you, but you are obviously a talented investigator and journalist. So I am going to go ahead and bankroll you on this. And, uh, you know, that's Telly Savalas. He plays this Lord Bostwick. Well, it turns out that the reason Lord Bostwick is willing to finance her plan is because he is a member of the Assassination Bureau. And I think it's kind of a combination of wanting to rein her in, but also he sees an opportunity because Bostwick is the second in command of the Assassination Bureau. And the one who's in command is Ivan Dragomoff, and that's Oliver Reed's character. And he inherited the business from his father who founded the Assassination Bureau. And Diana Riggs' character's idea is that she would hire the Assassination Bureau to kill the head of the Assassination Bureau with the idea that if they kill their own boss, that'll be like a snake cutting its own head off and the Bureau would fall apart. And at the same time, she would get her story that she wants to capture for the newspaper, right? 
So it's pretty good. Uh, it's it's a reasonable and at the same time a totally stupid idea, because you know the odds of the assassination bureau accepting a you know a hit on the head of the assassination bureau seems rather far fetched, especially when Diana Rigg manages to get in to see the assassination bureau and the person she's speaking to is the person that she wants to put the contract on. And that's Oliver Reed's character. But Reed is thinking, you know, this is my opportunity to clean house with the assassination bureau because the bureau has been straying from the strict moral code that his father had put down. And that was that you have to have a good reason to kill somebody and doing so has to make the world a better place, essentially. And I'm kind of paraphrasing there, but that's kind of where it's going. And so he thinks that the bureau is moving away from that. Telly Savalas and a lot of the members of the board are actually thinking, you know, this is stupid. We need to just kill anybody that that we get paid to kill. And more to the point, we need to be killing more people and causing social unrest because, hey, all of us can buy stock in the arms dealers. All of us can own a piece of the weapons industry. And then that means if there's armed conflict throughout Europe, it will boost our financial standing and we will kind of become the puppet masters running things from behind the, you know, behind the screen. And so it's a pretty audacious plan actually. And it's even more audacious that Oliver Reed has his plan and he decides to go ahead and take the, uh, you know, take the commission. And so he calls the heads, of the other members of the bureau in for a big meeting. And he says, Hey, uh, Telly Savalas, your Lord Bostwick is going to be kind of the mediator for this. And we will start in 24 hours and off he runs. And all of a sudden he has all of these different people trying to kill him. And at the same time, he is going around trying to kill some of the members of the assassination bureau. And the idea is if he wins, then the bureau will be his and it will run the way his father ran it. And if he loses, well, then he doesn't, I guess, have to be around for it. But let's face it, Dragomoff is the elite killer in this group. And he's also very arrogant and confident. And he believes he can take out everybody else on the Bureau, even if they're all teamed up against him. And during the course of all this, uh, Miss Winter, you know, Diana Rigg, is kind of following him around and later actually just is traveling with him directly, not even following him. And they have little adventures all over Europe, including a rather long scene at a brothel. And that was in Paris, if I'm not mistaken. And it was uh, it was a pretty funny little scene where Diana Rigg shows up at the brothel trying to track Oliver Reed down. And she gets mistaken by the owner of the brothel or by the guy who runs the brothel for the – okay, it's the owner – then the madam runs it. But the guy who owns it is one of the members of the assassination bureau. And Oliver Reed shows up to kill this guy and to get in to see him. He's disguised himself as an old man using all of Paramount's uh, spirit gum. So as Bill pointed out, so the budget for spirit gum was really high on this film. And that leads to a lot of hijinks because the owner of the brothel thinks that Diana Rigg is there to be a new uh, a new attraction at the brothel. And so she actually puts him in with uh, Oliver Reed in disguise. And then everybody recognizes everybody and a whole big mess happens. And they escape. The brothel kind of gets blown up. Uh, and Diana Rigg gets arrested as a prostitute. <laughs> so all in all, a good time was had in Paris that evening. And they gallivant all over Europe, end up in uh, Venice, and I'm not going to go into what happens in Venice, but let's just say that it ends with the Assassination Bureau believing 
that Dragomov is dead. And at that point, Telly Savalas is able to spring his master plan, which is to assassinate the heads of Europe at the peace conference that is happening because of the death of Archduke Ferdinand. And so the way he's going to do this assassination is with a clever new idea. They're going to drop a bomb from a dirigible. And this is kind of a clever idea because this is 1908. Nobody had really thought about dropping a massive bomb from an aerial platform at this point, I'm guessing. And so hijinks ensue. There's a whole lot of set pieces, a whole lot of gratuitous dirigible activity. Not and I got to say, a, I love one that. One not called Enola Gay, <laughs> let's just hope. Yeah, well, you know. And, that okay, that is one thing I was a little disappointed in. I kind of thought they were going to allude to this being an atomic bomb. And they kind of do do a mushroom cloud when the bomb does go off. Do. But it's definitely not the standard stock footage of a nuclear test that everybody used back in the 60s and <laughs> 70s when you wanted to show a nuclear bomb going off. Nor is it Linda Hamilton grasping onto a chain link fence near a playground. Ah, that's okay. Wow, way to what? way to Terminator Two. Man, that one. you see, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of. I'm gonna leave. The, I'm not gonna give the complete ending of the assassination bureau away, but I think we already did mention the fact that. Oliver Reed and Diana Rigg are at the end of the film, and Oliver Reed breaks the fourth wall to give us a little a little look and a wink when he's getting ready to go off with Diana Rigg. And, yeah, that's who, kind of... The who movie. is dressed as a nun just to really who, bring whatever you got going on home. Yeah, I know, and that was... <laughs> that. You know, I'm going to say that was another thing that they didn't play up, because she was trying to get into the castle to warn them that a bomb was coming. And they wouldn't let her in, but she noticed that the Sisters of Mercy, the nuns, mm -hmm. had free run. They could get in or go out of the castle. The so apparently at some point, off camera, I'm going to add, Diana Rigg probably beat up a nun to yeah. steal her habit and then go in to warn everybody. So can I just say... There was a, a strong probability of a nun beating off camera in this film. <sighs> she was too nice. She wouldn't have beat up a nun. I don't know. She was desperate to save those folks. <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh. I'm I'm one for the nun beating. <laughs> okay, and that, Nick. by the way, is a piece of audio that could be cut out, taken yes. out of context, and wind me up in a whole lot of trouble. Yes. But that's beside the point. I'm just going to say that when it comes to the Sisters of Mercy, Floodland was a great album. <laughs> <laughs> Another deep dive. Thank you very okay. much. That was a super deep dive, Bill. Thank you. And You're you know welcome. what that tells me? You really didn't like this movie, but you did think to do some deep dives for re for references. So thank Just, you. You know, got to earn my keep here. Got to earn another invite. <laughs> uh, you, you've already earned it yes. with your smooth, mellow jazz voice. Don't yes. worry. <laughs> True. Plus, you know, Mary's going to have her smoker's cough voice here. So we'll have to offset it. Um, just just wait till Nick and I decide to really go off the reservation and start our 1970s movies and television podcast. That's uh. all I'm saying. What was that noise, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> she was congratulating us, yes, I'm pretty that's sure. Oh, well, I'm that's glad you're was. congratulating us, Mary. Thank, Thank you. you, Bill. <laughs> so, so any last words on the Assassination Bureau? Mm -mm. Not really. I've already voiced my extreme displeasure, dropped a few nuggets for all the Mensa members out there, so I think I'm good to go. <laughs> okay. And <laughs> Mary, your response was a very, very, very well thought out, uh-uh. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> all mean, right. They, they did do a good dirigible special effect. They did. 
I think. And once again, I'm going to say that's one of those set pieces that they had to build for this movie. Mm -hmm. And I was very impressed. And I'm going to take it to another level. Oliver Reed ends up inside the rigid airship portion, not the passenger compartment, but in where the actual hydrogen is, or yeah, it's hydrogen in those, is stored. And they did a fairly accurate representation of what it would be like inside of that portion of an air, of a lighter than air rigid airship. Okay. And I know you don't care, Mary, but I care, <laughs> and I just wanted to bring that up. I just, you know, her okay one, is one just of those women's things. shorthand for <laughs> shut up, Nick. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I get that. So, uh, you know, I just did not realize hydrogen was green. <laughs> well, it's not. But they had to do something, and and I will also say that I don't think a face full of hydrogen would immediately cause you to just drop yeah. dead and uh-uh. turn green. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might. I don't know. I've never had a face full of hydrogen, and if it does, I don't want to. But I like the that, way he cut that one set of balloons out and jumped out. Well, I didn't okay, realize Barry, that those not giving were separate. away the ending. Not okay. giving away the ending. But... <laughs> okay, fine. We gave away most of the ending. Um, my comment there is, ask anybody on the Hindenburg. Mm-hmm. Hydrogen does not explode slowly. Yes. <laughs> when one bag of hydrogen is ruptured and explodes... They all rupture and explode I just, pretty much right then. I just didn't realize that they were separate bags like that. that you yeah. Could, oh, okay. I thought it was just one giant bag. Well, Mary, if you would like, I will. Uh, you know what? I'm going <laughs> to remind, remind me. I'm going to post a link in this uh, show notes okay. to a video about how rigid airships work. Okay. Okay. Because that is a perfect thing for this movie. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so we're done. This with episode the of the B Movie Cast is brought to you by the word rigid. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> and yet we still we still get to mark this episode as clean on iTunes. Uh, so there you go. Yes, this um, is good. So Mary, do we have any feedback? Yes, we do have a little bit. A little um, bit. Well, yes. what do we got? We have something from Patrick Kelly. Oh, rock on, Patrick it Kelly. says, hi there, Mary. I loved your narrow margin show with Kenny B. It motivated me to give that film another watch. It's only been three years since I last saw it, but that was long enough for me to forget the exact details of the major plot twists. Narrow margin is a great one. And bring back Kenny for more shows. He's a valuable addition to your roster of co-hosts. He is. Yeah. Um, I'm glad your slightly murder arrived safe and sound. You're most welcome. Thank you again, Patrick. He sent me a copy of his first book of that series of five books that he did. And I'm saving it for the hospital. So I can read it in the hospital. So thank you very much, Patrick. There you go. Yep. Uh, Next one's from Scott Wirtz. He said, I almost didn't want to enter because this one was too easy. (laughs) The Blob from from 58. um, From the creepy San Fernando Valley where we had a teeny earthquake this morning and a small plane crash up the street last week. Good times. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. Oof. Okay, um, let's see. We have a voicemail. From Captain Billy. So here it goes. Hey, Mary. Hey, Nick. Hey, whoever else is sitting in on the uh, cast today. Captain Billy here. Uh, Mary, that Claudia, Claudia, the, the Claudia that shot a skier. Yeah. There was Claudine Langer. Yes. I believe she was a model. Claudine? Claudia? Thank Claudia Langer. My apologies. Claudia Langer. She shot her skier boyfriend. Thank you. Because uh, you kept going on about Claudia Jennings, and I said, oh, I know that's not right. And then I eventually kicked in my brain. Uh, the only yes, thing I remember from that, I was a child when this all happened in the 70s. Uh, Saturday Night Live had done a sketch shortly thereafter about uh, basically a series of skiers falling down. Every time one fell down, a gunshot went off, and the announcer announced, oh, 
Claudia Langer has shot the man from uh, shot the skier from uh, Austria this time, and you know, so it was, just, it was seven or eight of those in a row. So, and it stuck in my brain because even as a child, I thought this was really kind of a bit much. So, now for the reason for my phone call. Oh no! So, for some reason, Nick has it in his head. I think it's Nick, maybe Mary a little bit, mostly Nick. About spoiling the movie. We don't want to spoil the movie for people. We're going to talk about the movie, but we don't want to spoil the ending. Look, I got to tell you guys something. <laughs> I don't think you've realized it. I'm sure I'm the first person to ever point this out. But for 500 plus episodes, you have ruined every movie and TV show you have talked about. Every single one. You <laughs> broke down the plot for 10 to 20 minutes. And I guarantee you there are people out there who don't bother watching the movie because it sounds too convoluted or it sounds too crazy or whatever. You You're have welcome. ruined every single <laughs> movie you have talked about. Aww. So how you got in your head that, well, we can't talk about the last four minutes because that will ruin it for everybody. You talked about the first 95 in detail, character names and what door they went out of and who turned left and right and what color the light was when they drove. You, you broke it up. But you're not going to ruin the movie by telling me the... Okay, imagine you're at a party and somebody traps you in a corner and they go, look, I saw this movie. I got to tell you all about it. There's this guy and this girl. They're on the beach and they're running into the water. Oh, and it's dark and they're drunk and the girl starts taking her clothes off and she runs into the water naked and then the guy's chasing after her and he's trying to take his shoes off, and he falls down in the sand, and he's laughing, and he passes out, and then the girl swims out in the water, and then you see her, she's swimming out, and she's calling the guy, and the guy doesn't come, and something brushes by her leg, and then the guy, the, she goes under the water, and then she comes back up out of the water, and then she goes back under the water, and then she starts screaming out of the water, and then she starts getting dragged. And then there's a shark that jumps up on the boat, and he eats the captain, and there's lots of blood and goo, and then... The shark goes away, and the boat is sinking, and the boat is sinking, and the sheriff climbs up on the mast, and the boat is sinking, and the shark comes back, and now he's trying to eat the sheriff, and the sheriff gets out. Uh, uh, he finds an air tank, and he throws it in the shark's mouth. But I don't want to tell you the end of the movie because I don't want to ruin it for you. <laughs> and then another guy traps you at the party, and he says, hey, I just saw this movie. I got to tell you about this movie. So there's this guy. He lives on a on a sand de uh, sand planet, and it's got two suns. But wait, wait, at the beginning of the movie, there's this big triangle spaceship, and it's flying out of the sky, and it captures this little teeny spaceship, and then you see there's a laser battle, and there's these guys who are just like white Volkswagens, and they're shooting their lasers, and there's these other guys who've got these upside-down planters on their heads, and they're shooting their guns, and then a big guy in a black mask and a black cape comes out, and he captures this little girl who's got cinnamon buns on the sides of her head, <laughs> And then they get the Darth, they get the plans for the big, the little thing that blows up planets. They get the, they get the plans for that, and they're going to send out their spaceships to blow up the thing that blows up planets. And their spaceships fly away, and then the guy in the black helmet, he comes back, and he's flying his spaceship. And the Volkswagen guys, they're flying their spaceships. But I don't want to tell you how the movie ends. I'm not going to ruin it for you. I'm going to describe the 100 minutes before the ending, but I'm not going to ruin them. Are you guys out of your mind? <laughs> Look, if I'm listening to a podcast and it's going to talk about a movie, <laughs> and I know for a fact you guys are going to describe it, you're the only podcast I listen to that describes the plot. In the, I listen to the Projection <laughs> Booth podcast. I listen to Derek's show, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Monster Kids, Tom Monster Kids radio show. <laughs> Nobody, they talk about the directors, they talk about the actors, they talk about the production, they talk about how much movies it costs, when, when the movie was made, they talk about circumstances, they talk about all kinds of, they don't break the movie down for 10 to 20 minutes and give you plot point by plot point by plot point by plot point. Because <laughs> that ruins the movie. You have told me the movie, why do I need to watch it? If I'm going to listen to a podcast about a movie, I, this goes for everybody who's listening, I guarantee you, there's only two reasons you listen. Either one, You've already seen the movie. Or two, you don't care if they're going to ruin the movie. <laughs> Every other movie podcast I listen to that talks about movies in detail, they say, we might ruin points of this movie. If you don't want the movie ruined for you, don't listen. Go watch it and come back. <laughs> this is the same thing you guys just said. And just talk about it. You talked about Clockwork Orange, and I'm 90% sure Mary ruined the end of Clockwork Orange. With some big <laughs> movie like that, Mary ruined the end of it. She couldn't wait. She wanted to talk about it. 
Did anybody complain that you ruined the end of Clockwork Orange? Did anybody bombard Facebook? Did anybody bombard your phone calls or emails or anything? No. We don't care. You have ruined 500 plus movies so far. Go ahead and tell us what happens in the last three minutes. Oh, by the way, I'll tell you what happens. It blows up. Jaws and Star Wars are the same movie. There's a big explosion at the end. There, now I ruined both movies. Now you don't have to watch either one of them. Oh, no. <sighs> Keep up the good work, guys. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> okay. Can I Man, just he's say never I listened want... to my show, thank goodness. I don't want to get scolded like that. Oh, no. <laughs> I was going to say, he, he totally, you know, I... Okay, I'm going to say this. I think we need Captain Billy to come on and do our uh, synopsis for us. Cause I was totally like, wow, he's doing a great job. I know. I know. And, and Star Wars, you know, the cinnamon buns, that is totally <laughs> accurate. Just saying. And but, I ruined this movie, too. <laughs> well, and you know what? Here's the thing. I will say that I try to tell people earlier in the cast, yes. hey, We're gonna go the watch movie. the movie. Stop yes. the podcast. Go watch the movie. Yeah. Come back. I know. And I do, okay, I have had on occasion somebody say, ah, oh, man, you ruined the movie. Wow. Well, my response to that is watch the freaking movie before you <laughs> listen to the podcast. But anyway, I'm still going to keep giving the warning. Because I'm a dick. Yeah. Okay, moving on. And, and, but by the way, Billy, I love that. <laughs> Thank you. And that was a great voicemail. That was. I felt yes. like I just got Andy Rooneyed. Yes. I feel you know, chastised and I feel seen at the same time. I yes. know, right? It's. It it made me warm and at the same time uncomfortable. <laughs> Welcome to your life. No, Welcome no to my comment. life. Now, this is awesome. Thank you for that, Billy. Yes, I, you, and Captain I do Billy. want you to come on and do synopsis. Yes. That was awesome. Yes. <laughs> okay. Our last uh, bit of email is from Christopher Page. Um, oh, Page. Yes. He says, the blob? Really? Not even a trickier shot? <laughs> okay. Uh, for all those who got that pretty much immediately, this was the message I got from Mary. Nick, make it super easy. <laughs> you make it too hard. Make it super easy. <sighs> I made it just about as super easy as any human could Yes. for I, a podcast called the B-Movie Cast. And, I mean, come on. And I even that, got it. That's how easy it was. So. Yeah. yeah. So if Mary can get it, then, yeah, it is the <laughs> end of time true true uh let's see he goes on to say well fine make it really easy and make it so there are more entries and therefore harder to win anything the blob from 1958 i can't remember the last time i watched that one uh to be honest it's been forever so definitely one i need to queue up again soon you know i haven't seen that in forever either well, maybe really, it's one you need to queue up I again really soon, think Mary. I do, yeah. Um, he goes on to say, "Hope everyone in the clubhouse is doing well. All good here, mostly. Busy, busy times. I've managed to watch some fun movies lately. Not good, mind you, but fun. A real sticker called Track of the Moon Beast." Oh, loves me some Track of the Moon Beast. <laughs> it was apparently made as a fairly gory monster horror movie but after sitting on a shelf for years while it lo looked for distribution someone edited it down for television unfortunately that edited version is all that exists now if that film ever made sense it was snipped out and ended up on the floor oh <laughs> oh uh went to drive in to see a showing of nosferatu that is so cool um, the organist, Jay Warren, doing the musical accompaniment. That is really cool. I, I didn't know they did that at Drive-Ins. Um, he used a keyboard and not an actual organ, but the keyboard used sound samples from a legitimate 1920s pipe organ. So it's pretty close to what it would have been like to see the film in a 1922 theater. Except you're in a car and you have a really big bucket of popcorn. I would love to do that. That sounds really great. That's um, awesome. 
on a giant screen like that, that'd be wonderful. Uh, I've been watching Full Moon Entertainment subspecies films. Oh, love those. Low budget, but really enjoyable takes on a vampire story. Prime Charles Band. I was a big fan of the early 90s Full Moon, and these films exemplify how well Band and the Full Moon team could do. You really have to watch at least the first three films together as they each pick off where the previous one left off and tell a full story. There is a new subspecies film coming out this June that will be a prequel film, but it reunites producer Charles Band, writer-director Ted Nicolai, Nicol, I have no idea, Nicolou, and stars Andrea Hove and Dennis Denise Duff. Really looking forward to it. The trailer looks great. Okay, sorry, email was longer than intended. Sorry, Mary. Take care, all. And that's Christopher. And he does the Time Shifter podcast and Orphan Entertainment. Yes. He does, and he yep. is just Good kind shows. of an he's kind of an awesome dude. Yes. 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 Agree. Agree. So thank you, Christopher. And that's the end. It's of nice the to get good words after you've been taken to the woodshed I by Captain know. Captain Billy. I know. I know. Captain Billy switched us. Wow. <laughs> no that's that's what my uh, that's what my granny would say. She's like, "You're gonna get switched." The movie wow. cast gets taken to the woodshed. Really? Yep. Hmm. Okay, Mary. I grew up back when you got switched when you did something wrong. Oh heck yeah! And you had to go fetch your own switch. Yeah, and Never. if you didn't get a good switch, you got a worse oh, switch. Oh, you were going back out. Yeah. Oh, I never even heard of been a there, switch. Been there, done that. Welcome to small town Georgia. Yeah, yeah. been there, done that, got the uh, scars, <laughs> both mental and <laughs> emotional and physical. Mm-hmm. Uh. <sighs> no, that's it. Thank you. I love hearing your voice, Bill. Aw, you're very Yeah, welcome. Bill, thanks for coming on, and I know it was a you're little bit very... short notice. Yes. That's all right, Big Daddy. You know, I love you. I love both of you. You've been very <laughs> kind to me and very, you know, uh, you've helped me get my show off the ground, and I'm very grateful. Plus, you know, Nick occasionally brings over bottles of bourbon, so just Oh, man. Now, I tell you what, I don't have one for uh, this next Friday. But I we'll have something. Uh, we'll have something later. I've got okay. a surprise. Cool, cool, cool. No, I love you guys. I love the B movie cast. Y'all have been very kind. I love you. And uh, call on me anytime. I'm always glad to help and come on the show. Yay! Sounds good. All right. <laughs> okay. Take care, guys. All right. Good night, take it easy, off. Mary. Okay. Y'all be cool. You too. Bye bye now. Bye. <laughs> Adios, Mafia. Well, they've gone. For good, John? No, just for now. It wasn't the right time for us to meet. But there'll be other nights, other stars for us to watch. They'll be back. Their ghosts are moving tonight, restless, hungry. All right, fellas, here's your story. Greetings, my friend. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. And we cannot keep this a secret any longer. Wait, Captain. I have found evidence of intelligent beings on this planet. Look to the skies. It's the B-Movie Cookbook. Menus inspired by 15 of your favorite B-movies from the 1950s. With teenage werewolves, blobs, and enough cheese for everyone. When we return to our planet, the High Court may well sentence you to torture. But until then, we've got Ed Wood and Vincent Price. There'll be food and drink and ghosts. And perhaps even a few murders. You're all invited. So impress your friends with dinner and a movie. With the B-Movie Cookbook, we've got you covered. Get your copy today at bmoviecookbook.com. That's bmoviecookbook.com. Let me see that book. I am interested to see what sways your mind so heavily. Sure thing, just visit bmoviecookbook.com. Anybody around here want some coffee? Transmission. The good guys all.
always wins, even in the 80s.